I would guess most of you know the answer to this question. What was Jesus' favorite method of teaching? Lecture? Group discussion? Assigned readings? Parables? Yes, Jesus loved to tell parables. In fact, the Gospels attribute about 50 parables to Jesus. On many Sundays, we read a single parable of Jesus. Consider what it means to his first century audience and then wrestle with its meanings for us today. Our hope is that if we engage our minds and open ourselves to God's spirit, we may glimpse a new insight or be reminded of an important bit of wisdom. Some of Jesus's parables are like an onion where we peel back layer after layer. They are so provocative that we discover multiple meanings to ponder. Other parables are like the love we have for our spouse or partner that takes on new dimensions over the years. These parables are so rich that new meanings emerge as our spiritual life matures. And some of Jesus' parables are like your daughter confiding in you that she is gay, shattering all of your stereotypes. These parables shock us into questioning our convictions and prod us to see the world in a new light. Some parables of Jesus, like the Good Samaritan or the Prodigal Son, are lengthy and elaborate. Today we hear an occasion where Jesus fired off five pithy parables, giving his audience then and now plenty to contemplate. Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, or as Matthew calls it, the kingdom of heaven, more than any other single subject. Yet it is an elusive concept because Jesus addressed it in so many different ways. I can imagine the disciples having a private meeting with Jesus in which they attempt to nail down the precise meaning of the divine dominion. Peter asks, Jesus, is God's kingdom already present or is it something coming in the future? To which, to which Jesus responds, yes. Frustrated, he sits down and lets Andrew take a crack at it. Jesus, is God's kingdom here on earth or is it in God's heavenly realm? To which Jesus responds, precisely. Visibly annoyed, James tries to gain some clarity. Jesus, is the kingdom in plain sight or is it hidden? And Jesus says, absolutely. The kingdom of God is a slippery term that's hard to wrap our minds around. Jesus never provides a concise, unambiguous definition of what he means. Sometimes he even gives what sounds like contradictory descriptions. Overall, the scripture leaves us with the impression that the kingdom is so magnificent that it is more that we, than we can grasp. Jesus constantly draws pictures of it by comparing the kingdom to ordinary things we can understand. And that's what we find in today's passage. He delivers five rapid-fire metaphors that impart an impression of God's kingdom. He says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like yeast. The kingdom is like buried treasure. The kingdom is like a valuable pearl. And the kingdom is like a fishing net. So let's look at each of these one at a time. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, which are interchangeable, is like a mustard seed. You might be recalling to yourself the part where it says, if you just have faith as small as a mustard seed, this is not that. Here we're talking about the kingdom of God, not faith itself. In that other example, the main point is that mustard seeds are very, very small, right? Here, Jesus doesn't just stop with the small size, but talks about the explosive nature, that something so small becomes something so big. And for a moment, we'll pretend that that's the truth about mustard seeds. So the kingdom of God is like a small seed that when planted grows into a great tree where birds can nest and find shade. Remember, this is the kingdom of God we're talking about, not faith. So it's the kingdom of God that grows in size. Except here's the joke. A mustard plant really never gets to the size that someone would call it a tree. It might be a large bush, but not a tree. And here's another kicker. The mustard plant, it was considered a weed where Jesus was. And it's considered a weed elsewhere too. Maybe you have been to California and seen the beautiful yellow mustard plants in wine country. But no wine grower would want those plants growing with their grapes. Mustard is a weed. It's obnoxious. It spreads. 
If it attracts animals, it is definitely unwanted in any kind of garden. The kingdom of God is like yeast mixed with flour. Now, to those of us who love bread and especially yeast products, this sounds great. Maybe we can take it as justification for eating all of those carbs we love so much during lockdown. Just kidding. I don't actually think Jesus is trying to inform our diets here. But his choice of items did put up the alert antenna for his listeners. First, we need to know that the original word that gets translated here as yeast is more accurately translated as leaven. Yeast is a kind of leaven, which means they are both elements that encourage growth when used the right way. The only reason it is important to know that it is different is that leaven was considered a symbol for moral corruption in the ancient world. Leaven has come by differently than yeast. So in Jewish custom, even still today, one practice for Passover is eliminating all leavening agents from one's possession the unleavened bread of Passover. This helps us to know how confused Jesus' Jewish hearers may have been that the kingdom of God is like leaven that a woman took and mixed with flour. When the people spend most of their time trying to get rid of leaven by God's command, why would mixing leaven into flour where you can't see it and it might, you might not even know it's there, why would that be a good thing? Mixing, mixing leaven into the flour would make the flour useless because it would have to be discarded. And it's not like the parables here mixes just a little flour with the leaven. It has the woman mix in three measures of flour, which for us would be like 50 or 60 pounds of flour. And that is a lot of leavened flour that needs to be dealt with. And then we have a woman mixing the flour. In Jesus' day and time, it was men who represented, represented purity. Women were impure just by the very nature of them being a woman. And then we need to address the fact that our reading said today that a woman mixed the leaven with the flour. The Greek word translated as mixed here is more accurately translated as hid. We're not talking so much about kneading here as we are about hiding in the negative sense. It's not just covering the leaven with flour, but concealment. In this parable, then, we have leaven, an agent of corruption, being concealed with a lot of flour by a woman who would not have been considered pure. The crowd may have been imagining that Jesus told the story all wrong, that the proper terms for God's kingdom were unleavened, a man, and open or revealed. What in the world does this parable then mean to say about the kingdom of God. If the mustard seed parable hints at the weedy nature of the kingdom of God, and by that I mean it spreads, often where you don't want it to, and without knowledge of its spreading, then the leaven parable takes it one step further. The concealment aspect of hiding the leaven in the flower almost has a sinister sound to it. Yes, weeds are annoying and spread and grow, even without water it seems but the leaven is purposefully being hidden in the flower. How is the kingdom then like a treasure hidden in a field where upon discovery a man sold everything he had in order to buy the field or like a merchant who discovered a valuable pearl and liquidated his assets in order to own it? Jesus is saying that once you grasp the value of God's kingdom, you will go to extreme measures to obtain it. Nothing compares to God's kingdom, but it requires a wholehearted commitment such that we will risk everything in order to be part of it. Finally, Jesus says that the kingdom is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good fish into baskets, but threw out and threw the rest back. The parable looks towards the judgment day and touches on the theme that God looks on the heart. It is the heart and spirit of humankind that counts in the kingdom of God. So when God's angels pull in the great drag net one day and the fish are sorted out, that is what will distinguish the good from the rubbish. Not people's wealth, not their power and glory in this world, but whether their heart is right with God. With this final parable, Jesus is also contrasting the Roman Empire with God's empire. 
The Roman Empire relied on propaganda, oppression, cruelty, and greed, violence, and fear. God's empire relies on truth, justice, compassion, generosity, peace, and hope. One kingdom will bring you death, and the other will bring you life. What will you risk in order to acquire it? Jesus seems to have told these five brief parables not to describe simply the essence of God's kingdom, but to encourage our participation in it. He does not want us to be swept up by the kingdoms of this world and miss the one kingdom that is life-giving and everlasting. To that end, these parables are packaged together to confront us with a decision. But first, the question remains, what do these parables tell us about the kingdom of God? A few things. First, God's kingdom invades everywhere. God's kingdom and God's work in this world is not controllable and it's not easily stopped. The kingdom of God is unexpected, even unseen, and maybe even subversive. Just like the roots of the mustard plant or the work of the leaven, God is at work even though we might fail to see it or perceive it. God's kingdom is at hand. It is here, friends, in the ordinary things of life. God shows up, sometimes where you least expect God to be. God's kingdom is worth giving up all that you have. It requires total commitment once you understand its worth. You will stop at nothing to obtain it. God's kingdom is about truth, justice, compassion, generosity, peace, and hope. And it gives you everlasting life. Stop pursuing other kingdoms that lead to death. God cares about your heart, not your wealth, power, or position. Friends, these are all good news for us, especially in this world. And we could even say, even after the events of this past week, we need to be reminded that God is here. God is at work. God's kingdom is already present whether we are helping it along or not. There was a news story in 2017 about a large truck on I-5 in Tacoma, Washington, that was carrying leftover bread dough to a processing plant where it would be repurposed into feed for livestock. The driver had loaded garbage bags full of dough into the truck, as he had been doing for years. But on this day, the temperature would reach uh, the high of the mid-80s, which sounds super cool to us right now, but that was hot for Washington. And he encountered more traffic than usual from a nearby military base. The combination of the heat and the yeast in the non-refrigerated truck made the dough rise so that it caused the bags to expand and burst. And the dough began seeping out onto the highway. The driver was on the road for an hour before he noticed the falling dough and pulled over. The dough didn't present a hazard and there were no accidents because of it. And after some quick cleanup by state troopers, he made it to the feed plant with what was left. Friends, the kingdom of God is like bread dough in a truck in warm weather. No matter how hard you try to contain it, it just spills out onto the road and invades the lives of all those who encounter it. May God give us the strength and the will to continue to do God's work in this world. And when life is hard, when we're put down and discouraged by all the division and injustice in our world, may we remember that while we are invited to it, the work of God's kingdom is not left up to us. God is at work even when we fail to be. God's kingdom grows and expands and spreads despite our best attempts to cut it down. Praise be to God for that. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, the invitation is this. We are called to be kingdom workers. And as you go to do God's work, remember that God's kingdom spreads like a weed it keeps coming back. There is nothing, nothing we can do to stop it. 
No matter how much weed killer the world tries to spray on it. The kingdom of God is also sometimes hidden and elusive. So we are to keep our eyes open for the ways God is at work in the world. God's kingdom is so amazing that once you experience it, you will do anything to keep it, to participate in it. And it requires total commitment on our part. God's kingdom is about truth, justice, compassion, generosity, peace, and hope. And it gives you and I everlasting life. Stop pursuing other kingdoms like wealth, power, and fame that lead to death. Friends, God cares about you, about your heart, and about your relationship with Christ. That matters more than anything. Stop worshiping politicians, rock stars, and sports heroes. They were all given their gifts by the same God that gave you yours. Remember, they can't save you. God has already done that. Friends, you also can't be too young or too old to be a kingdom worker for Christ. As it says in Matthew chapter 8, verses 37 and 38, Then he, meaning Jesus, said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So go, friends, for we have work to do. As we sing our hymn of response, I encourage you to pay special attention to verse 3.